So, hello everyone. Warm welcome to today's Eden session related to the education in the time of new normal. Uh, I'm very happy that we have uh, today on the agenda the new digital action plan. Um, just let me briefly uh, give you an overview of Eden initiative related to the education in time of pandemic. Uh, as you know, when we were faced with the pandemic uh, in February, March, which uh, affected all uh, our lives uh, in every sphere, especially education, Eden promptly report, responded, starting with the initiative Education in Time of Pandemic. And already on March 30, we started with a series of Eden webinars, practical webinars aimed for teachers and educators to help them find out how to organize their teaching and learning online and to help ensure that all students uh, have access uh, to materials, to, to, to um, uh, the courses, and to finish the uh, school or academic year. We ran for 11 weeks. Uh, we had 35 speakers and moderators, uh, over 3,500 participants. Until uh, now, we had more than 9,100 views of recordings. Based on very good uh, feedback from the participants uh, for the spring initiative, and their uh, wish that we continue with uh, this initiative, we started the autumn initiative, slightly different title, Education in Time of New Normal. Today, this is our sixth and last webinar in this uh, initiative. So far, we have 26 speakers, uh, over 730 participants, and till the webinar number five, we had uh, review recordings more than 1,000. So uh, I'm very happy that we are uh, finishing uh, our autumn initiative with a new digital action plan, its presentation. Uh, I think as this um, new digital action plan was just planned to come uh, for our last webinar to, to be on time. He, he was uh, recently adopted by European Commission. And definitely uh, this uh, digital action plan is trying to address the challenges arising from ongoing COVID-19 crisis and long-term digital transformation. I'm certain that you all recall the digital action plan from 2018 to 2020, which had priorities in a way that uh, uh, how to make a better use of digital technologies for teaching and learning and digital competencies and skills of uh, uh, citizens, educators, uh, students, uh, uh, everyone, and also improving education through better data analysis and foresight. And definitely we are the number of activities uh, there was an um, uh, um, impact and uh, how to enable the member European member countries uh, develop uh, the, the competencies of their educators and students and how to uh, integrate uh, ed uh, technology, uh, digital technologies into education process in a proper way, in a way to enhance the quality uh, of education. Um, I think that this new digital action plan was wisely uh, planned in a way that um, it gathered the, the stakeholders and also the public to participate, to give the feedback, and based on their feedback during the first uh, first uh, uh, part of the, the COVID crisis, uh, I think that very well uh, conclusions uh, have been made and uh, new, uh, uh, new uh, the priorities uh, have been created. And uh, what, uh, what, why do we need uh, such uh, plans? Definitely so that European countries has some kind of uh, guidance, some, high, some kind of, kind of uh, uh, the, the uh, service where they can find the, the uh, ideas uh, and the guidelines how to uh, prepare and how to integrate their educational systems in a way that they collaborate and that they respond to the need of digital society, but also to be able to work together uh, jointly uh, with uh, European countries uh, in 
sharing the experience, but also enabling uh, the mobility of the students uh, uh, as well. So uh, today we have the uh, title of the session, Digital Education Action Plan 21, uh, 2021-2027, Resetting Education and Training for the Digital Age. And I'm very happy to have the authors uh, of this action plan with us. Uh, so uh, let me uh, introduce uh, the speakers today. Georgi Dimitrov, who is Deputy Head of Unit Innovation and uh, European Institute of Innovation and Technology and project leader on a new digital education plan from Director, Directorate General Education, Youth, Sport and Culture at European Commission. Georgi is been, has been with European Commission for quite a while, um, having a number of roles. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy that uh, he was at the behind, the, 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 the motor behind this new digital action plan. And we were, as Eden, also honored to be able to contribute small in a small way uh, to development uh, and gathering uh, of the feedback uh, on this digital action plan. Also with us is Veronica Mobilio, policy officer from Directorate General Education, Youth, Sport and Culture, who was uh, also uh, been contributing to the implementation and update of the Commission's edu Digital Education Action Plan. And she led the activities connected to the evidence base of Digital Education Action Plan 2021-2027 and its staff working document. And Yves Puni, Deputy Head of Unit Human Capital and Employment Joint Research Center from European Commission. And um, he's leading its research and policy activities on digital learning and skills, a research area providing evidence-based policy support to European Commission on harnessing the potential of digital technologies to innovate education and training processes, improve access to lifelong learning and other uh, things. So thank you all for being with us today, for wanting to share the, the best of the new digital action plan. So um, I would like, Georgi, to give the floor to you to, to hear from the first hand why this digital education action plan and how can we all benefit from it. So thank you, floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra, and uh, good afternoon to everybody here. Uh, I should add uh, around the globe, I was just following the chat and then I saw um, people from many, many places, which is one of the fascinating uh, parts of this new uh, normal. Um, and uh, to be able to meet you at the same time and to discuss uh, our work is a, is a privilege for us as well. So we are very glad to to have been invited to, to be here with you. I should start by thanking Eden and uh, especially you, uh, Sandra, for, uh, for this excellent opportunity to, to speak to you and to discuss. As you have mentioned, um, we have um, already spoken about the action plan uh, in the last few months and we consider ourselves to be quite lucky to be able to work firsthand, uh, firsthand with the researchers who are actually the people on the ground and the real experts so I'm very glad that we can today um, uh, talk to you and with you about our, our work. And it's true, you have a very nice um, uh, title of the whole um, um, webinar series, um, Education in a Time of New Normal. I don't think that uh, I should uh, elaborate too much, uh, too much on this. Uh, thank you. And um, um, I, I should just say that um, uh, probably as trivial as it might uh, sound, um, I think that this year and uh, in particular this um, this pandemic uh, is probably one of the greatest challenges to education and training systems in decades that we have experienced. And um, unfortunately, it's uh, by far not yet over. Um, nevertheless, um, I am an optimist type of person, so I always look uh, to the bright side. And this is why I would also add that... Um, this crisis has also led to a, to a leap um, in terms of the digital transformation and in particular in education and training, um, which, um, which I think would have taken otherwise perhaps some years. Um, um, so um, there are always, as you know, pros and cons of, of the things that happen around us. 
Um, I think that um, the, the COVID-19 crisis um, was the first experience for many people in terms of distance and online learning. In fact, you will hear a little bit more later from my colleague on the results of the consultation, but I think our, our um, open public consult consultation showed that for 60% of the people, this has been the first experience. Obviously, many of them in primary and secondary education, uh, by far not as many in, in higher education, but still. Uh, we're talking about a, a very qualitative difference. Um, and I think that what we have seen, um, generally speaking, is that um, we have essentially seen problems that we knew were there, but um, they were um, basically put to the surface and they were accelerated. We have seen huge gaps in connectivity and infrastructure. Um, we have uh, seen uh, deficiencies in, in the skills of uh, teachers and educators. We have also seen, um, in particular for smaller, um, for younger uh, pupils and students, we have seen um, many parents who were overwhelmed by the situation. We have seen also young people who have um, uh, been lacking to an extent guidance and um, uh, the way forward. And um, very important, um, um, is that we have seen deepening um, inequalities um, and uh, new divides, which um, are one of the most disturbing um, factors that, uh, that come out through this crisis. And I believe that those inequalities um, by far do not affect only education. You can observe them in the labor market. You can see them in many, many other areas of life. In any way, this crisis has been and is an opportunity for us to reset education and training for this digital age. And um, I think that this is why we have put forward um, what we believe is a more ambitious and coordinated effort. And uh, this is where we invite um, everyone, including you, to be part of it. And with this, I would like to move to the next slide. Um, this slide has a QR code, uh, which is handy, because uh, what you can do there is uh, to find the documents which are behind this initiative, there are two of them, one communication, uh, which is a shorter policy document and one staff working document, which provides the evidence for the different actions. This will be explained by my colleague Veronica Mobilio in more detail. Um, and um, I would like to also mention that um, since a few days, uh, the action plan is available in all EU official languages. Uh, the action plan was adopted very recently, um, in fact, only three weeks ago on the 30th of September, and uh, has as a main objective to foster high quality, inclusive and accessible digital education in Europe. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So this is the context that we are in. Um, starting from the left to the right, uh, first of all, um, the importance of digital education um, is not really uh, as high only since COVID, but in fact was something that um, our new commissioner president or at least uh, president since uh, one year ago has put in her guidelines and has committed herself to in the form of a new digital education action plan, which we are now discussing. So this came before um, the crisis. Next to it is the very ambitious and concerted effort of the European Union to address the question of digital transformation uh, and to talk about a Europe fit for the digital age. And this digital transformation, uh, as all of you know, addresses all areas of life. But importantly, now um, uh, is also recognized, uh, at least at the EU level, to include uh, prominently education and training. Uh, this is very important uh, because uh, we operate in a field of uh, subsidiarity, meaning that um, the competences uh, in education and training lie with, it, with the member states and the European Commission um, is supporting those education and training systems, but we are not in any way defining or, um, let's say, um, creating any new curricula, etc., etc. Next point uh, that you, Sandra, also mentioned is that we are not starting from scratch. We have already um, implemented um, to, to a great extent the first digital education action plan. And this is also where I would like to say that Eden has been um, part of the conversation right from 2018 onwards. 
Um, but of course, what is also true is that COVID-19 has been a game changer and continues to be. Um, and first and foremost, of course, showing the importance of digital education, in particular in the modality of distance and online learning, um, but more generally, uh, bringing to the, to the surface the questions which are coming with it and the question of prepara preparation and readiness. Last but not least, um, what we have experienced is an unprecedented effort at the European level to help member states to recover and to build resilience out of the crisis. This is the last um, uh, box that you see icon here on the right side, which is called the Next Generation EU, which is an unprecedented uh, effort at the EU level amounting to some 670 billion euros of grants and loans to support the recovery and resilience in member states out of the crisis. Let me just mention that 20% of this budget should go into the digitalization and we hope that a very big part of these funds will go into education and training because they are obviously one of the areas that need most um, attention. We can move to the next slide um, indeed and um, just me briefly mention the very extensive stakeholder consultations uh, that in fact also um, uh, Eden was part of and um, you see here on the slide multiple uh, screenshots um, uh, because indeed many of it took place uh, online uh, so we're all now familiar with this type of uh, souvenirs um, but um, indeed we started uh, with uh, some more physical um, uh, conversations and then moved completely online what you see here is um, um, a selection of some of the um, events uh, with our executive vice president, um, Margarete Vestager, with our vice president, Margarit Skinas, uh, with our commissioner, Maria Gabriel, but also, for example, with the chair of the um, European Parliament Committee for Education and Training, Sabine Verheyen. Um, I am mentioning all these names because there is one point that I want to make here, and this is that um, um, other than in the past, um, the attention that has been given to digital education this time around is uh, much more wide. It is, it is much more encompassing the different areas of policies. And indeed, it speaks to the, to the importance of the subject. Uh, what my colleague, of course, uh, Veronica will tell you more about is um, also the open public consultation and some of the lessons learned. Um, suffice it to say here that we have received a huge number of contributions um, 2,700, around 130 position papers. Um, but Veronica uh, will tell you much more about the details. Now, if we move to the next slide, what we are going to see uh, is the guiding principles that we identified for, uh, excuse me, the key aspects that we identified for the um, uh, Digital Education Action Plan. And here, um, I would like to stress that we are taking an integrated approach for technology use in education and training and digital skills. Um, what this means is that um, we regard the subject of digital education, if you like, as um, one coin which has two parts. On the one side, it's the use of the technology in education which needs to be purposeful, pedagogically sound um, and safe. And on the other hand, we have the question of improving digital skills. We are going forward uh, with the extension of the scope beyond formal education. This is very important because we are looking into lifelong learning now. Um, I'm mentioning this because in the first um, iteration of the action plan, we have focused only on formal education. Then um, learning from the lessons in the last two and a half years, we are extending the duration of the action plan in order to align it better with the programming period of the EU. It's about being in sync with what is happening elsewhere in other policy, policy areas. And something which is very important, and I already touched upon it, is the question that digital education becomes more and more a strategic priority for a Europe fit for the digital age. So in the same um, way that we are talking about digitalization of our uh, societies or maybe of our economies, we are taking more and more um, interest and, and paying attention to the question of how this actually uh, affects education and training. Um, one very important aspect which I mentioned already is the recovery and resilience plans which um, comes with the um, available budgets that the European Commission is uh, putting forward. I mentioned it already 
We're going to support the member states in their own uh, strategies. There is no one size of fit, uh, fits all. Um, my home country, Bulgaria, has different needs than the country that I work in, etc. And this is where um, we're working together with the member states in order to define better what they need. Last but not least, we are proposing to have strong synergies between the different funding instruments. Now, if this sounds very technocratic, uh, then it may well be because part of our mission is to make those um, people sensitive to the subject which take decisions. And um, I would like to move to the next slide and briefly introduce some of the more um, underlying principles of, of the Digital Education Action Plan, which are, if you like, explaining a little bit the rationale of, of what we are putting forward. First and foremost, I think um, the key objective here is to support high quality and inclusive di digital education. Um, and in fact, before the pandemic, digital education was something which was often a responsibility of a, of a small team or a division in some educational institution or a ministry, not very rarely, also slightly is isolated maybe sometimes. Well, I think that the crisis is demonstrating that this is not a marginal issue, but it is something that should become center stage and should be a central component for learning, teaching, and assessment in the 21st century. Next is the issue of education in the digital age. And I think that transforming education for the digital age is not something that can be outsourced or, or just um, delegated to the education ministry. No, this is a task for the society and needs to be including researchers, um, private sector, etc. Very important is to invest in connectivity, equipment, and organizational uh, capacity, um, which are vital because without them, uh, basically uh, no effective digital education can take place. And the same goes for teachers and, and trainers, which need to be competent and confident users of technology. Very important point is the question of digital literacy, which um, is essential. Um, because it, um, in fact, enables, uh, first and foremost, a better understanding of the digital world. So we are talking about um, computing education, computer science, informatics, um, but we're also uh, addressing the question of advanced digital skills, which is um, a natural part of, of, um, of the skills needs and um, is more, as we know, uh, needed, uh, more and more needed for the digital um, transformation of the society and the economy. Last point is um, the question of high quality education content. And here, um, what we have observed through the crisis, but also in the longer term, is that we need high quality education, digital education content in order to be relevant, in order to have high quality and inclusiveness of our education and training systems. Um, perhaps next slide. There are two key priorities of the Digital Education Action Plan. You see them um, in front of you. On the one side, developing a high-performing digital education ecosystem. And secondly, it's about enhancing digital skills and competences for the digital transformation. As I said, I like to see this as the two parts of the same coin. Um, and with um, perhaps with this slide, we can, uh, we can move on to um, showing a little bit more what is behind each of them. So next slide. Um, under each priority, we have a number of limited actions. We are starting here with the first one, um, the first priority. And there, what you see on this slide is a very compressed way of expressing the, um, the, the actions. But let me just mention a few of those. We have policy level actions which really target the member states um, because there is just so much that the EU can do. Um, not only because of its uh, size and limited competences, but also because the, the music, if you like, is playing at the, at the level of the member states. So the first two actions are about um, enabling a strategic dialogue with the, with the member states on factors for successful digital education, such as connectivity, teacher digital skills, uh, infrastructure, uh, stakeholder engagement. Or um, the second action, which is about um, working together with the member states on a council recommendation on online and distance learning for primary and secondary. Why on those two fields? Because we know that in, in higher education, distance learning is much more advanced in primary and secondary. It may well not be necessary also to be so advanced, but it definitely lags behind 
as we see from the data in multiple regions or member states of the European Union. Then um, action number three is about um, the need for a high quality digital education content, which I have mentioned. And here in particular, we are thinking about the feasibility study around a possible European exchange platform. Why? Because um, we are considering how to create better synergies between existing uh, platforms and also to um, perhaps um, enable uh, more uh, high quality digital education content creation uh, for which there are a number of, of uh, quality criteria which are um, necessary. Um, not surprisingly, um, action number four is about supporting connectivity and uh, making use of existing um, EU support for uh, broadband uh, investment for digital equipment um, and uh, e-learning applications. And this is the context of the recovery um, re and resilience plan. And perhaps moving to the next slide, we are going to see the last two um, actions in this field. First, the idea to support digital transformation in all, um, all sectors of education and training, starting from primary, secondary, higher education, adult learning. Uh, this is not mentioned on the slide, but I'm just mentioning it here. The idea is to um, support education institutions through Erasmus Cooperation projects to develop their own digital transformation strategy. And um, uh, link to this is targeted support to teachers uh, through the Erasmus Teacher Academies, as well as the um, new uh, upcoming online self-assessment tool for teachers, Selfie for Teachers. Some of you are familiar with the Selfie tool. And then last but not least under this priority, the idea of how are we going to deal with the more and more, um, let's say, um, emerging uh, role of AI and um, how we can develop ethical guidelines um, on artificial intelligence in teaching and training. Perhaps moving to the second uh, priority um, is then the question, uh, the question of what are the actions which are uh, under the enhancing digital skills and competences for the digital transformation? Well, here, um, obviously, as the priority is saying, we would like to promote the uh, development of such skills and competences but what are we going to do concretely? Well, um, we are going to um, essentially support the competence development um, in the digital field in a number of different ways. First of all, um, creating guidelines to foster digital literacy and tackling disinformation uh, through education and training. Um, I will not go into detail of why this is important, um, but it is important to start very early and support our, our education and training systems. Then updating the digital competence framework, uh, which uh, my colleague Yves Puny will also uh, mention something about. Um, and I think you are all familiar with the highly successful uh, digital competence framework on which we want to further build on. Um, a very um, uh, important uh, action is around the need to develop a European digital skills certificate or a way with which digital skills can be better transferred, if you like, between different constituencies or, or uh, even perhaps legal regimes in, at some point. Um, and similarly, what is important is that together with the member states, and this is why Action 10 uh, reads, propose a council recommendation on improving the provision of digital skills so that we work together with the member states because ultimately it is there where the responsibility lies on. Um, to expand the provision of digital skills in many different ways. And I don't really have the time to go into the, um, uh, into the detail on this, but happy to take any, any questions on that. Perhaps moving to the next slide uh, and concluding on the second priority, and I'm almost done, is the need to, first of all, improve our cross-national collection on data on student digital skills. Um, I know that most of you are active in the research field, um, so I hope that you would agree that um, the situation in terms of the cross-national collection of data when it comes to uh, the student um, uh, cohort um, is not optimal. And uh, what we are thinking of is to introduce a relevant target for such a student digital competence based on the ICOS um, uh, study uh, that could be expanded to as many member states as possible. Then um, we are proposing under action number 12 to expand the digital skills um, provision through our already ongoing digital opportunity traineeship. It is currently targeting higher education only, 
we have seen that it is in high demand and would like to expand it to uh, vocational education and training, but also to educators and teachers, two very important target groups that have so far not been covered. And last but not least is um, the need to continue to address the persisting gender gap in STEM. And here we're proposing um, specific actions uh, on how we can promote a better um, participation of, of, of female students uh, in STEM fields together also in cooperation with the um, EIT. Um, moving to the last slide, um, I would like to mention that um, all of this requires um, stronger coordination and cooperation at the EU level. And um, we have been told this time and again in the last uh, few months. And we believe that um, this is a very important issue that we have to also address. This is why in the action plan, we have proposed the creation of uh, a European digital education hub, which um, would have several different functions. On the one side, um, it would bring, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a network of national advisory services that already exist, um, national advisory services on digital education in member states to exchange experience and to provide peer learning, um, enabling them to talk about their recent experiences, not only with COVID, but also longer term, uh, and bringing them really for, the, for, for, for now together. Um, we would also think about um, monitoring the implementation of the action plan and sharing better and more um, focused um, the good practices from our ongoing projects, but also by contributing to research. Uh, third is the issue of how we can better bring the different sectors, if you like, researchers, the private sector, the public sector, education and training, etc., etc., civil society, how we can actually bring them together since many of them have a role to play in this new um, mode. And lastly, um, we would like to enable a more agile development of policy and practice. And uh, it is here where I would give uh, the floor or pass over rather to Veronica. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gergi. Uh, well, it was music for my ears because uh, I work here in Croatia as uh, in Serce as the we are national coordinator for supporting high education institutions in e-learning, and sometimes we all think we are feeling like we are like Don Quixote finding fight, fighting the windmills uh, in a way that we do not get uh, enough support from the the ministry or from from the government in in our work. And so I, I, I have a question for you before we go uh, on. Uh, what do you think, how can a teacher, researcher, or a, for example, uh, institution working uh, on, on this topic, like supporting uh, 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 teachers and educators, how they can contribute to realization of this new digital action plan? Um, so I want to be very uh, pragmatic here <laughs> because I took a lot of time uh, already for of your attention. Um, I would say by identifying what is interesting for you. I have taken the time to put forward uh, 14 different aspects and you can actually further break them down. What is very important is that um, we identify, first of all, or you identify or the relevant institution or the relevant teacher, the right interesting um, point or the research question or whatever it may be that is really the core interest. It could be disinformation, it could be how institutions uh, manage digital transformation. Uh, it could be how to better cooperate with the private sector. There could be many different aspects. I think that this is the first step. Um, the second uh, very important step is that um, um, we, let's say, uh, find out about these different interests. And I think that this is a conversation that uh, we, we do also because we would like to find out what is relevant for you as, a, as a stakeholders. Um, but we are going to create in the future uh, more opportunities uh, on how to uh, perhaps together address some of the problems that we identify. Uh, there could be different ways of doing this. There could be projects that um, support this through the Erasmus program. There could be um, uh, perhaps um, events such as this where we can maybe discuss some of the, the questions. Um, there might be other opportunities such as working groups that we would have to create and I could not go in uh, into this level of detail, but for no. some of these actions, we're going to do that, set up 
working groups. And in fact, you are part of Delta, uh, the Delta working group. Yeah. Uh, so you know more or less that, that part of the question. So let's start by identifying what is the right angle for your interest. Mm -hmm. And then reaching out to us, I think that our commitment is that we are uh, listening to, to, to you and that we together, uh, as much as possible, define the answers to the questions. Thank you. Okay, so let's go further in, in a way so that we, uh, we are able to, to hear everyone and we will uh, have questions in the end. We already have some questions, but uh, now I'm giving floor to Veronica to give the part uh, regarding the research that was uh, done uh, in order to prepare the new digital education action plan. So Veronica, please, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, so um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for, for the opportunity. Indeed, I'm going to talk about the research that fed in the preparation of the digital education action plan. So if we move to the next slide, um, as Georgi said, uh, the communication on the Digital Education Action Plan was published uh, together with a staff working document. Now, what is a staff working document? I, I like to describe it as a sort of uh, research paper that provides evidence and background information for the actions that are suggested in the, in the communication. This was done by using research and policy documents published in the last two years, but also specific data from existing data sets, uh, as DESI, Eurostat, ICILS, and so, et cetera, and also through extensive, uh, stakeholder, um, extensive input received by stakeholders that we consulted in preparation of the initiative, including through an open public consultation. Uh, now, today I decided to focus on the OPC, on the open public consultation, because even though we cannot consider the results representative of the European population and the European member states, they are very useful to actually confirm few things that we see emerging from research, ongoing research on the topic. So if we move to the next slide, here you can find a um, sort of overview of the OPC replies. Uh, Georgi said that we got 2,700 replies. These are from 60 countries. People could reply in a personal capacity or uh, on an organizational capacity. So the majority of them replied on a personal capacity. And then the, the majority of people in this case were uh, educators and parents. Uh, of course, on the other side, uh, between those that replied on an organizational capacity, the majority of them were education and training institutions. This to give you a sort of overview of who replied to the OPC. In the next slide, you find a um, recap of the main fundings of the OPC that uh, I think they were already well described by Georgi. Uh, in terms of uh, describing the situation that we saw happening in many countries when it comes uh, to the COVID-19 crisis and uh, lockdown period. Parents were overwhelmed, uh, learners were missing face-to-face -face interaction and guidance, educators were struggling to do, due to low capacity of their institutions. The situation was not positive. Uh, this comes out very clearly from the OPC. But there is a positive side, and the positive element is that many of the respondents saw the crisis as a turning point, as something really having a long-term impact on education and training. And the quote that I put here in the low, um, on, on the right, in the low part of the slide, I think is very nice because it says it very nicely why we suggested an integrated vision for digital education in education and training. If we go to the next slide, here I put these three charts, which are about the use of uh, online and distance learning before, during, and post, uh, post <laughs> among brackets, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So we can see on the left that 59% uh, uh, of respondents said that they didn't use online and uh, distance learning before the crisis. The use of online and distance learning increased uh, largely during the crisis, and the data that we collected through the OPC 
uh, say and confirm that their use is likely to increase also in the future, at least to a certain extent. Here also, there is a very interesting funding when it comes to um, trying to understand what type of uh, distance and online learning was used during the crisis. Because what we see is that the use of real time, so which means live classes, increased more than the other type, so the, the one on in, uh, one on time, even though uh, the use of pre-recorded classes and uh, online learning materials was used more before the crisis it's, uh, as such. So this, is, this seemed very interesting to us because it somehow confirms that uh, when education and training institutions closed, the most feasible solution uh, was the one of transposing the lessons online and trying to keep the learners engaged by delivering to them online classes. So that is uh, very interesting to us. In the next slide, you can find a very another very interesting uh, funding. We asked the respondents to actually tell us what they thought about the measures that were implemented at national level. You can see from the charts that um, the majority of the people were happy about the measures. Uh, they considered them successful. But actually, when you go deeper to try to understand who said what, uh, we found a very big discrepancy between education and training staff and par uh, parents and learners, with the first ones being way more positive than the others. So somehow the crisis helped uh, educators to get to know digital education and to use it. And somehow they are also happy about what they managed to do considering the situation. But on the other side, uh, learners and parents uh, struggled uh, a lot throughout the process. There are also a few other interesting elements uh, when it comes to the success of the measures, which are related. Uh, the first point that I wanted to make is that uh, the satisfaction appears to be higher uh, at the higher education sector, confirming somehow, somehow that there, there was a higher level of preparedness in um, online and distance learning. And the second element is that uh, the OPC results confirm um, that the vocational education and training was the education sector that somehow struggled the most in ensuring uh, uh, continuity of education and training. In the next slide, this is actually also very interesting. So, it's about what people needed during the crisis and they didn't get. So if you go through, uh, so what you find here is the most um, selected element by each target group. If you go through the table, you can see that there is a very nice parallel, parallelism between learners and parents and education and training staff on the other side. Learners and parents basically focused on uh, interaction and guidance that they were really missing. While on the other side, education and training institutions uh, focus much more on the enabling factors, especially from a technological point of view. So they mentioned very often connectivity and infrastructure as something that was really a problem during the lockdown. The other interesting uh, funding here is that um, when you look at the second most selected element, support for mental health comes out across all target, target groups. This uh, is something that we expected somehow, but to be honest, it was also a big surprise from the OPC. Uh, and it's something that considering the still ongoing crisis, is, uh, this is something that uh, policymakers and stakeholders at the national level will need to look, at, uh, to look into in the future. In the next slide, here uh, you can see the challenges for digital education in Europe on the right side, and then on the left side, the elements that uh, allow education and training institutions to improve their use of the digital technologies for teaching and learning. The challenges uh, are the ones that basically Georgi uh, mentioned, uh, inequalities, 
infrastructure and connectivity, teacher training and skills, uh, the lack of uh, plan and visions uh, for digital education and the fact that online content available are not always um, high quality and addressing the needs of education and training institution. When it comes to the enabling factors, uh, the most quoted element is competencies of teachers. And this surprisingly comes even first, uh, even before having a strategy and a vision for digital education. Then of course, other elements that are crucial are uh, the resources available, the platforms uh, that needs to be secure and ensuring connectivity and infrastructure to, to, to participants. You can see that uh, from Georgi's presentation, we try to address all these elements in the new action plan, uh, and we will make our best to, uh, to, 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 to keep working on these uh, elements uh, in the best way possible. Um, in the next slide, I think we go to the digital competencies. Um, here, uh, not surprisingly, People uh, in the OPC, uh, participants in, of the OPC highlighted a lot uh, the fact that the crisis increased uh, somehow the importance of digital competencies. Uh, and particularly, they stressed uh, the importance of digital literacy as a key component of digital, uh, digital competence that everybody needs to have nowadays. So this is a very important funding uh, that we found. The other uh, important element is that 62% of uh, participants declared that they believe that they improved the digital skills du during the crisis by teleworking and by using online and distance learning. But the key funding is that half of it of them uh, desire wants to keep improving the digital skills in the future. So this is a very important funding. And uh, what makes it even more important is that this is particularly true for education and training staff. So educators and uh, trainers, they really have light. Okay, I learned throughout the process, but I want to get better and to be better in the future. The other important funding on the digital competence is that when you look deeper and try to understand what type of digital competence they would like to improve in the future, creating digital content, digital content creation comes out, which means that the crisis helped the educators understand that if they have to move to distance and online learning, they need to be confident in creating the, their, their lessons, in customizing them, and in using digital uh, tools for, let's say, the learning process uh, um, in, in a comprehensive way. While on the other side, for learners and parents, uh, the most important competencies relate to safety when navigating online and also protecting uh, data and privacy. So there is uh, different perspective, let's say, between the different uh, target groups. In the next slide, um, you can see a sort of recap of what respondents uh, said when it comes to the role of the European Commission and the European Union. Here, again, what is really surprising and uh, it's really striking is that, again, support for teacher competence development is a leading area of support is the most important one. And then connectivity infrastructure, uh, capacity building um, uh, support, uh, disadvantaged groups uh, and quality of online core content come as uh, following elements. But as Georgi said, uh, I think the most uh, transversal element that we can see really clearly emerging from the uh, stakeholder consultation that we have been running since March until the very end is the need for more cooperation at, um, across different stakeholders. This is a very important funding and it is the re reason why we suggested the uh, creation of the European Digital Education Hub. And if we go to the next slide, um, I, I would like to stress that actually this was also one of the fundings of one of uh, the specific stakeholder consultation that we have been running in preparation of the action plan. 
back in August, in cooperation with the, GG, uh, the Joint Research Center, we organized uh, a research workshop engaging researchers from different member states working on, the, on investigating the impact of COVID-19 on education and training. We had an online session, of course, and a very interesting discussion to, to try to understand what is that we know and what is that we don't know and we should know in the future. And outcomes of that conversation are very important because, again, the need for cooperation came up very strongly. And in particular, um, researchers uh, stressed the need for better links between the research on one side and the policy making on the other side, which means that we are very much aware of the need to open this dialogue, including the research community, which is um, from our perspective, uh, a very important stakeholder to include in the dialogue around digital education. And the other key element that came up very strongly from the participatory workshop with researchers is the need for further research looking into the future of education and training, which is actually what Eves uh, is gonna, uh, is gonna present uh, in a few minutes. Um, if we move to the next slide, I am uh, over with my presentation. I hope that I did manage to stay in the minutes that I was given. But I wanted to, 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 to say that if uh, participants in this webinar want to know more about the uh, OPC results and the stakeholder consultation, in the staff working document, there is, a, there is an annex dedicated to it. But most importantly, um, we recently published a new report co-authored with the JRC, who support us uh, in analyzing the replies to the OPC. And this report is really about uh, the fundings, uh, a very deep analysis of the fundings uh, of the OPC. And I put here a link where you can actually access it because it's not in the same page of the communication and the staff working document. So I only thought that uh, it might be useful for participants to, to, to have the reference on that. So that's from my side. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, very good, uh, the points. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the numbers, the percentage show that uh, uh, really high relevant uh, uh, things that we should fo put focus on and maybe this uh, discrepancies with the, the ed between educators and uh, the learners and parents on the other side, uh, it's, it's very important to see how uh, each of them is looking uh, to the education uh, as such, you know, from different points uh, point of view. So uh, this is something definitely should we should be uh, fo put focus on more uh, to so that we all have the same idea and set get the satisfaction how actually a digital education should look like. Um, I'm certain that the majority of uh, teachers uh, have been doing online uh, teaching in a way as emergency remote teaching so definitely the 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 definition of open uh, of online education uh, and online teaching and learning uh, was different between uh, teachers and and learners so uh, yeah maybe uh, just uh, one question uh, 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 for you um, is there any overlap between this action plan and European Union, Union, Union Green Deal in terms of resilience and recovery? Because uh, the, the Teresa Finch is asking, she feels there are so many opportunities here to align on capacity building. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 from my perspective, there is uh, an overlap in the sense that uh, these are two very politically important uh, objectives. And of course, uh, the, 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 the fostering digital competence development means also contributing to the green trans tra tra transformation. So uh, we need to work on the two pillars uh, in synergy to make sure that there are the two objectives uh, reinforce each other. And actually this is also what we have um, envisaged for the Digital Education Action Plan. Thank you. Let's move on now to Eve. So Eve, what is Joint Research Center preparing for us now? Hello, good afternoon. 
Thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Aidan, for organizing this webinar. Thank you also, colleagues, and everybody to be present today. So, okay, I'll try to be short because we are uh, running out of time. As uh, Sandra said, what I will try to do is very briefly, and also my colleague Veronica and uh, Georgia also mentioned that actually we at the GRC, we are part, you know, part of the in-house research laboratory of the European Commission. We provided a lot of support and analysis uh, to, the, to the Digital Education Action Plan, a lot of evidence, a lot of research and analysis behind it. And we were working very closely together with them to actually provide uh, as much as possible uh, the good uh, and most recent evidence to back up the Digital Education Action Plan. And actually, you can find that, as Veronica said, in the, in the staff working document, where you find a lot of references to studies and analysis. Of course, not only to our own research, but obviously to also to uh, very good research, which was provided by colleagues uh, outside of the GRC. Next slide. But what I will very briefly present to you, and actually this, this list of uh, the GRC recent publications, uh, these data and analysis has actually also already been taken into account in the DEAP. And just briefly to share with you, because I'm, I structured them in related to COVID-19 related research, then the DEAP priority one related to the high performing digital education systems, and the DEAP priority two on the digital skills and competences. And you see there are a number of studies. Uh, first of all, related to COVID, obviously, it was very difficult in the beginning to get already data on what was happening uh, during the, 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 the school closures and the, or the, the shift to digital online learning. So what a number of researchers did, we, but also others, is taking existing data sets uh, such as PISA, PEARLS, TALIS, Eurostat, and try to reflect and use the existing data sets from the past to try to understand what kind of risks and challenges and opportunities we were experiencing during the, the school closures. And obviously, it was also already mentioned by uh, uh, Veronica, the educational inequalities uh, have been really uh, confirmed in these and other studies. I mean, uh, access to infrastructure, access to devices, but also uh, psychological support. We all see a lot of evidence that actually those families with lower socioeconomic background have been struggling much more uh, than other uh, families uh, uh, to survive during the COVID uh, school uh, period. And that is certainly something uh, we need to address and you find evidence there. Then also related to priority one, we actually very recently released uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a study a report on emerging technologies and the teaching profession, looking at uh, near developing near future scenarios uh, on how the teacher's profession is changing uh, through the use of these technologies and actually trying to raise some of the ethical and pedagogical concerns that are also mentioned in the Digital Education Action Plan. Uh, this relates, for example, to uh, who takes the pedagogical decision, the uh, algorithm or the machine versus uh, the teacher or the educator. Uh, and we developed there the notions of uh, teacher in the loop, teacher over the loop, uh, to understand when the teacher should be involved and when not. For example, in low stakes educational decisions, the, 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 the algorithm can take decisions, but when there are high stake uh, uh, decisions to be made, then obviously a, a teacher or pedagogical uh, 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 decision needs to be made by, by a human and not by, by the machine. In relation to digital competences, we released also two reports on DigComp at work. Uh, with a selection of case studies and also with an implementation guide. Next slide. Then maybe more interesting what's upcoming. Uh, we will release a number of uh, two new reports uh, still this year. A qualitative study to understand how, but then real evidence from what happened during the last months uh, on the impact of the shift to digital learning during the, uh, during the confinement, qualitative analysis in five EU member states. And they will also, we also conducted a survey uh, uh, of families and children in 11 countries, uh, asking them about their experiences. And their also a report will be released at the end of the year. 
related to the high performing digital education systems, you know, of course, there is selfie. Selfie was mentioned in the first digital education action plan. It is to be continued, but it is not as such renewed as a new action because the action is already there, but it's still to be continued. Uh, supporting schools with their digital capacity. And we're going to release a report together with the European Training Foundation uh, with experiences from lessons learned on how selfie can be used uh, 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 to improve the digital capacity of schools. We also in Spain have a representative analysis of selfie uh, results, which we're going to release uh, later in the year. We do also more psychometric analysis, looking at specific analysis, for example, teacher collaboration and students' digital competences. Also look at, try to get some evidence on if there is a policy intervention, how does it affect the school's digital capacity and the use of selfie. Uh, so there are a number of uh, studies we're going to release there as well. There is one on educational technologies in China and their implications uh, for COVID. Actually, this should be in the first uh, batch, uh, which, uh, and the lessons for Europe, uh, which we want to release also still in November. And then uh, we also have, as I think many of you know, we have the DIFCOM EDU self-reflection tool uh, out there. And we are going to release various publications on the results, uh, uh, analyzing the results from the use of the self-reflection tool. Uh, also for higher education, there, for example, in Spain, we work together with CRUE, uh, the rector's universities from all universities in Spain, and also Mitterrand, which is the Latin American, uh, the Spanish speaking universities all over the world, where we collaborate with them. Uh, we're going to release also still this month or next month in November, a report with uh, the, the argument of the DIFCOM self-reflection pilot we did. So this was targeted to, uh, to individuals uh, and we will have a methodological guide and an item bank which is fully developed with the psycho uh, psychometric kind of analysis. So we're going to release that report as well. Next slide. Uh, and that's what that will be the last one. Uh, so, uh, so you see, I can be very brief. Uh, obviously, we will continue the COVID related research because this is here for the moment, unfortunately, still to stay. We will do continued analysis of the impact of COVID on uh, learning, on the shift to digital learning and obligatory schooling. We're also participating in a study together with UNESCO and the EAA, uh, which wants to do a survey on educational disruption survey. Um, in addition, we continue developing, uh, as Selfie for Teachers is now mentioned as one of the actions in the new digital education action plan, we're going to do a full pilot uh, to develop a self-reflection uh, instrument and the fully again do full validation on the basis of psychometric analysis. We are going to release also a selfie module for work-based learning and uh, on the existing selfie which very soon in, in, in less than 10 days will celebrate its second year. We're doing specific, uh, several analysis, text mining of the qualitative data, a qualitative impact study we're going to do also feasibility for a counterfactual impact analysis uh, to see the impact of uh, selfie on schools digital capacity. We're also going to uh, launch a study on computational thinking and obligatory schooling in Europe. And then uh, finally, we're also going to work uh, and start the work now very soon on uh, uh, the development of a new version of DICCOM, so the version DICCOM 2.2, uh, which will be where we will update especially dimension four, the examples of knowledge, skills, and attitudes to also take into account artificial intelligence, uh, disinformation, uh, all the new kind of trends and also COVID experiences that, that we've been experiencing to, to update somehow uh, the DICCOM framework and to make and to use more recent examples uh, to, 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 to demonstrate that the framework is still uh, future proof. And we're also going to collaborate on this new initiative, which is mentioned, European Digital Skills Certificate. And there was actually one question raised, uh, raised in the question and answer. Uh, someone asking, what is this European Digital Skills Certificate and how it's going to look like? Well, I can already reply saying that actually that is exactly what we're going to research and investigate. So this is not yet defined. This is not yet set. But the coming year will be used to do analysis to look at how existing certification schemes work uh, and then uh, 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 propose different scenarios 
of the development of such a European digital uh, skills uh, certificate, or at least a way to uh, recognize uh, and, and to enable, uh, to facilitate the cross-border uh, uh, recognition of digital skills uh, certificates. Because that we observe that uh, there's a need for that uh, from stakeholders. So you, you see quite a full agenda. Uh, that is, of course, from the GRC side. From our side, there's of course much more to study and to do also just looking at the DERP, uh, looking at the, the, the 14 actions, and especially looking also at the staff working document, you see there's much more room uh, and need still for much more analysis to understand what works, uh, under which con con conditions, uh, for which target groups, and what doesn't work. So we still need to improve that evidence-based and we will work with that. We will work on that at the GRC, but of course also with all relevant uh, research institute outside of the GRC, with Eden, with other uh, networks. Um, I mean, because we are of course in, 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 an, in a definite need to get good evidence, good analysis to improve uh, the digital education and the digital skills uh, in Europe. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Really high number of activities. You are busy as always. Uh, I see uh, very good uh, news about this uh, number of reports and, and issues that you will be researching. Eden is, of course, always here to help uh, uh, in, in, in research, but also in dissemination of the results uh, and helping to, to gather uh, people and community to participate. So uh, we have a number of questions uh, at the moment. I'm opening now the floor for the questions. Um, maybe I will start uh, uh, the questions uh, uh, with, uh, from this point of view. Uh, I have asked something uh, at the beginning, but for example, we have two questions. One is from Vlad Mihaescu, who says, are you and the European Commission planning to send this plan directly to policymakers, government and parliament, uh, helping putting these decision factors in contact with experts in the field who could help locally in each uh, country? Because there are many cases of lack in communication between uh, these two sides, and which is also contributing the second question, are there any plans to give support to digital strategies and development? Uh, uh, so uh, basically, uh, uh, the European Commission has uh, adopted this digital education plan. It's here, it's open. How to communicate to the member countries that this is not only stayed on high level, but also go uh, uh, to top down. So, Georgi, Georgi, maybe this is a question for you. Yes, thank you, Sandra. I, um, I, uh, I think the, the question of, of what Mikhaescu is, is very pertinent uh, because it's a, it's a problem that uh, many big organizations have uh, in terms of communicating externally. Um, what uh, we are going to do is that we are going to present um, this action plan to the member states. In fact, we have already done this in the format uh, that we work in uh, in Brussels with the people who are responsible for education and training, which are those that come from the ministries. And we are doing this not only once, but we're doing this multiple times because the level of detail uh, that they request is, is much uh, different than, than what we have been able to cover today. So um, we are indeed uh, doing this. In fact, tomorrow morning we're doing exactly this uh, over three hours. Uh, so um, this is not going to be sufficient, though, uh, and we are going to um, uh, have a more, I would say, wide-ranging communication uh, around the action plan. Um, we will uh, communicate um, uh, through the um, uh, ongoing, uh, let's say, channels that we have through, through the Erasmus channels, but also through the future activities. I have mentioned that one of the ideas through the European Digital Education Hub is to bring the different stakeholders together because um, I think it is very important that we reach out to those stakeholders that are not necessarily part of the policy making process but are directly affected by it or you know can contribute much more. I think that we are in exactly such a domain that, uh, that we should um, reach out. So uh, yes, uh, you're absolutely right. We need to communicate. And uh, secondly, to the question of the digital um, uh, plans, um, and strategies. I have mentioned uh, in one of the actions, and I refer you to, to the action plan, the support um, to digital transformation plans for all type of uh, education institutions. 
primary, secondary, higher and adult um, education institutions that will be supported uh, through Erasmus cooperation projects um, from 2021 onwards in their digital transformation plans. And this is a very broad uh, subject. So there will be a lot of opportunities for education and training institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. Uh, very good. Uh, this is very important. The communication part, I think it's it's highly appreciated because uh, basically uh, only via communication we can uh, get things spread uh, uh, further. Okay, thank you. Let's move to the next question. Maybe Veronica uh, here can uh, uh, answer. We have a question from Maya Queen. Uh, she said she asked, she's asking re regarding the European Digital Digital Education Hub. How can an organization get involved to get and share good practices? Where we can keep track on news about this? This is a very hot question, I would say. <laughs> we, uh, Georgi, I think can, can confirm. Yes, we can yeah, pass yeah, like. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, you, you heard, you heard, uh, thank you, Veronica. You heard that it is hot, uh, which means that it is very, very important uh, for us. And um, no, but uh, coming back to, to your question. So I think that uh, this is one of the brand new and um, um, let's say uh, ambitious uh, ideas uh, of this action plan. And this is going to be very much work in progress. So um, what uh, you can do um, in terms of keeping track uh, on the news, because this is your question, first of all, on finding out what is happening, is to uh, stay um, in touch with uh, the, some of the channels that we use. Uh, for example, the EU Digital Education uh, Twitter channel, where we communicate on all our activities related to the action plan. So I invite you to, to use that channel at EU Digital Education. Um, more generally, what we plan to do is to build up activities uh, gradually over next year and uh, next year to be able to come out with, um, with uh, also a website which would be featuring the different activities that are related to the Digital Education Hub. But uh, first uh, line of communication, I would say, would be our social media channels um, just to find out what is, what is happening, uh, stressing that this is very, very um, open process and uh, it is very much a work in progress. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to address myself as well question, but we have also one question related to the uh, open access and open education resources. Uh, as you mentioned in the digital education plan, it says um, high quality uh, and inclusiveness uh, of educational content. Uh, it, it, did, it didn't go further. I was reading the, the digital education plan, but I didn't find uh, that open education and open access is mentioned there. Uh, what so uh, do you think, do, did you plan uh, uh, to push uh, this uh, uh, as well as uh, importance of open education in, in the terms of quality and, in, and, uh, and uh, the accessibility to everyone? So who is willing to, to answer this question? I, I can start maybe with some remarks and if my colleagues would like to, to, to mention um, other aspects now. The open education resources issue is not new for us and we have been uh, strongly advocating this uh, since you know, the opening up communication, for example. This is seven, eight years ago. So yeah. I don't think we should be repeating things that are, let's say, uh, already on our agenda. Uh, but more generally to the question of content, I think that what we are promoting here um, is not closed or open systems. We're promoting a level uh, playing field where choice is available and where um, the question of, um, of um, effective and open and inclusive platforms can be decided uh, by, the, uh, by the needs, in fact. So um, we're not saying that uh, one is better than the other. One platform is better than the other. Um, what uh, what we are saying, and I think that uh, we, we are also saying this in the evidence, that there are there are um, um, positive uh, positive aspects to to the different um, let's say ways of, of addressing this. It is very important that we acknowledge the, the the strong network effects of existing platforms. We cannot ignore the fact that uh, um, all um, let's say you know five uh, leading platforms for online education are outside of the of the EU. We, we cannot just make it unhappen because because we you know we just want so I think it's it's important to acknowledge also that part of the discussion and of the of the strong network effects that are 
taking place in digital economy and uh, in particular in online digital education uh, platforms. So um, we, 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 we are taking a, um, a careful approach, not advocating one or the other, but we are definitely in strong support of open education resources. I can say less about open software itself because that's not really our cup of tea here, but um, when it comes to open education resources, we have said that in the open, uh, opening up education, we are strong supporters of op open standards uh, of inclusiveness, and uh, we believe that um, you know transferability, compatibility of content is very, very important. Um, it's just that this may be achieved sometimes by different means. Yeah, good. Maybe maybe if you can continue because uh, uh, looking at the uh, all the these uh, uh, things you plan to do in research, uh, did you plan to perhaps to to investigate? how much open education has been used used last six months since the lockdown uh, and open educational resources uh, has this number increased and did people uh, in a situation when they have locked down went for open educational resources uh, as a way of uh, learning or uh, if uh, this was the uh, perhaps the 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 way to compensate the, the formal education, which was uh, yeah, uh, at that moment uh, highly questionable uh, in a way of uh, 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 producing, producement. Yes, thank you, Sandra. Uh, definitely, no, we in the qualitative uh, study uh, we are undertaking, we obviously we are looking at content, we are looking at available learning resources, and obviously we are also looking at the availability of open uh, content, uh, the, the ability to share and, and reuse it as well, if that's the case. So this is part of the of the template of questions uh, that we are that we are uh, have developed, you know, to do the research. So obviously we'll take into account it's not an exclusive focus on open education or on OERs, but uh, when we look at content, it is part of the discussion, of course. So and we hope to be able to to also bring some results related to that as well uh, in our research. Uh, and, um, thank you. Yes, Veronica, please if continue. If I can, yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that actually uh, uh, in the results of the OPC, we see uh, very clearly a key role that uh, the presence of um, open educational resources played during the crisis. Uh, two are the elements that the respondents uh, mentioned uh, to actually highlight uh, when the situation was managed better. And the two elements are the presence of a strategy and plans for digital education within the institution, and then the use of the institution of open educational resources. So indeed, they played a key role during the lockdown and the use of digital yeah. uh, education in that yeah. period. Thank you very much, very useful. Uh, maybe Eves, going back to you, the the relation between Digicomp uh, Edu Checking Tool and the Selfie Project for Teachers. What is the difference or relationship between these two projects? It may be confusing uh, uh, for for teachers. Yes, I can understand. So, okay, so this is a bit of a technical question, uh, but I'll try to clarify uh, briefly. So, what we developed in the beginning as a kind of an experimental project what was we called the Dicom Edu uh, check-in uh, tool, uh, which was available, and it is still available for all education sectors, primary, secondary, higher education, lifelong learning. And actually the check-in self-reflection tool is, is quite well used. I think we have more than 40,000 responses already, almost 50,000 from all, all over the world. So, so, but that was, and still is, as we called it, an experimental uh, first trial based on the DICOMP EDU framework. Now, what we're now doing is actually revising uh, the items and the questions uh, and also now fully uh, piloting and testing it and also checking all the psychometrics, the, uh, the, the reliability, the validity, uh, discrimination analysis, so actually to ensure uh, that when we then uh, come up with a new tool, which will then be a revised uh, check-in, will, will be the selfie for teachers. But that will then be a version fully tested, fully piloted. Uh, and that's the difference with the check-in tool. The check-in tool was an experimental tool, but it raised so much interest that it's actually quite widely used. 
uh, but actually we were never able to fully uh, validate and test it. Uh, so that's the difference. We're now going for a fully validated and tested uh, tool for school uh, uh, educators. Uh, and that's why we call it Selfie for Teachers. And then in the meantime, uh, at the later on, if we have time and available resources, a similar process uh, can be done uh, for higher education because there also we see you know a big interest from higher education institutions from all over the world also within europe for the for developing obviously the digital competence of uh, of educators thank you thank you Eve. Uh, we are coming to the uh, end of our session we already exceed, ex exceeded the, the, the planned time uh, a number of questions i have left the smaller one uh, uh, to, to not to be answered maybe if you had uh, a willing and time now to, to just provide short answers uh, in Q&A. Um, what is definitely important that uh, at this moment digital education, education action plan have to be communicated to all stakeholders uh, quite widely uh, in a way that uh, uh, it doesn't reach only the ministries but it also reach the other stakeholders uh, engaged and uh, participating in education and training in, in their countries. And uh, definitely, I would like to congratulate you uh, for coming up with this digital education uh, action plan uh, in such times when we had the COVID uh, pandemic uh, working <laughs> against that. But, but at the same time, uh, it was, uh, I would say, like incentive to, to make a shift, to make transition. You know, some of us have been working for 15 years on some things and then overnight come pandemic and make it happen. You So, so uh, well, take advantage of, of, of the situation. Um, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much for finding time to be with us uh, today. Uh, I think that we provide a number of answers, but definitely we are looking into European Digital Skills Certificate. Very interesting thing. Uh, I will, I'm certain that it will be a highly uh, 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 recognized and interested among all of us and definitely digital education hubs as a space for coll collaboration and sharing uh, know-how. Uh, we would all like to engage there and collaborate. So uh, looking forward to this uh, item especially. So thank you again for being with us today. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye and thank you very much. Goodbye.